Okay, I wanted to provide a bit of background and a little bit of an overview on this particular reading from our first session and how that might impact or influence the type of research questions that you are preparing when you look at your IRB application. So I'm, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about this, then I'm going to bring in a couple of other pieces that I want to um, highlight for you. So as we're looking through this, and I'm not going to go through it section by section or anything, but I do want to point out some particular important aspects of it. Uh, the first thing is, yes, I understand that this was written in 1983, which is, uh, you know, bordering on 35 years old now. And uh, But in all honesty, if you were to replace the word media with technology every time you see it, it is still quite accurate. Uh, this idea of um, you know Clark 83 is is the dominant view within the field of educational technology. Um, so, if you look at what he's done here, this is actually really a very systematic literature review. So, in thinking about your own chapter twos, this is actually on the high end of things. And I say on the high end because you'll notice it was written or published in the Review of Educational Research, which is a journal that only publishes reviews of, of literature, um, and they are one of the most prestigious journals in the field of education, not just educational research, but education in general. So, um, you know, this is one that is an exceptionally well-written piece in terms of its actual structure and, and, and um, the way in which it's put together and, and the arguments that it makes. The other thing that you really want to note here is that while it's written in 83, you'll know that Clark actually goes through and provides, you know, decades worth of literature and research that he builds into his argument. Um, so you'll see that there's a wide variety of citations that are used there, talking about all types of different media that had been used in, in the research up until that point in time. And in all honesty, you could actually write a review of this or an update of this, and he did in 1996. It was published in um, Educational Technology Research and Development, so some 13 years after the original one was done. And um, actually that particular piece uh, spurred a series of articles. So you had uh, Richard Clark wrote a, an article um, in Educational Technology Research and Development in the early 90s and then a guy by the name of Robert Cosma actually wrote a response to that and then a year or so later there was a special issue of Educational Technology Research and Development that actually focused entirely upon this issue of media comparison studies. Um, you know, so as you're looking through, um, one of the things that you want to note is that he goes through and sort of reviews all of these various studies and some of the issues that um, they have had in them. And the biggest issue that he sort of really focuses upon in terms of a theme throughout is this idea that um, when you teach with technology you teach differently than when you teach without technology so it's not necessarily that you're comparing pedagogical strategy A with technology and pedagogic strategy A without technology. One of the things Clark argues in this piece is that the presence or absence of technology actually changes how we teach so what you're actually looking at is pedagogical strategy A with technology versus pedagogical strategy B without technology. And that causes this confounding of issues because you don't know whether the results that you get at the end of the study were caused by the differences in the pedagogical strategy or the fact that the students were using or not using technology. Um, so that's one of the main things that he talks about in here, one of sort of his main themes. The other one that he talks about um, is this uh, idea, and, and he's got a full section here, but this idea of the uncontrolled novelty effect with newer media. Um, you know, one of the things that often happens when students have access to a new tool or a new technology or new software um, is that there is a novelty which leads to an increased motivation and an increased perseverance to be on task. And again, one of the confounding factors with that is the fact that 
if the student is spending more time on task, if they are persevering with that task for greater lengths of time, um, you know, and, and willing to, um, you know, if you think back to your educational psychology classes that you would have had as part of your credential program, you know, if they're willing to stay in that zone of proximal development for longer periods of time while they're trying to figure out what it is that they don't know simply because they enjoy the novelty of using whatever that new tool or that new technology that new media is again when you look at the results of research is it because of the technology or is it because they spent more time on it or they were willing to persevere longer in that or they were spending uh, high, an additional amount of time within their zone of proximal development um, as you know they were going through it so again you can't isolate the effect of the technology there because there are all of these other uh, problems the third thing and this is one that a lot of folks don't consider when we look at the research and I'll be honest with you when I was first introduced to Clark it was one that I had never thought about um, when you look at journal editors and people that publish things in general, very often will you find things that are published where we say that the technology had no effect whatsoever. Um, it's actually titled No Significant Differences is the actual specific methodological finding that you would have. And within the field of, of education, um, up until actually earlier this year, or I guess earlier in 2016, because we're into a new year now, um, there was a complete website that was being hosted by um, a university in the southeast that was called the No Significant Differences Phenomena, and they were actually collecting a list, and they were up to, uh, it was tens of thousands at this point, of studies that had been published or released that had no significant difference as their finding, meaning whatever they were comparing, there was no difference between the students that used whatever it was. In some cases, it was a technology. In some cases, it was a pedagogical strategy. In some cases, it was uh, the way in which we structure our schools or something like that um, against people who weren't in that particular environment. And, um, you know, so one of the things that you have to remember is, you know, there are two things happening here. There's a great deal of research, much of it that doesn't get published, that finds no difference that we never ever hear about or that finds a negative difference that we, again, often never hear about. And journal editors and book publishers also have a vested interest in publishing things that look like they will work. So those that have positive effects or those that have positive findings, regardless of the other problems that Clark has mentioned here, those tend to get preferenced a lot more. So when you sort of do a literature review like you're doing now and see you know what the literature actually says about your topic, there's a good chance that you'll find a higher percentage of articles that find in favor of whatever it is you're looking at not necessarily because most of the studies have found in favor, just most of the ones that actually got published found in favor. Um, you know, so these are some of the things that, you know, as Clark calls them, some of the confounding variables that you want to consider when you are looking at your uh, studies that you're planning to do. Now, interestingly, you know, one of the things, and I'll scroll down to near the bottom here now, um, that Clark talks about. Uh, first of all, and, and I can't underscore this enough because within the field of educational technology, probably one of the most common metaphors that you will hear, regardless if you're a faculty member or a student, is this idea of the delivery truck metaphor. Um, as Clark refers to it, you know, um, the line that I've he's used in his own presentations is that media or technology impacts learning the same way that a delivery truck impacts the nutritional value of the groceries that it carries. In both cases the medium is or the truck is simply a delivery vehicle and it is the instruction that is delivered or in the case of the truck it is the groceries inside that contain the value in it. Um, you know, in the case of the food, it's the nutritional value. In the case of the instruction, obviously, it's the potential for student learning is the value that we're looking at there. Um, so in Clark's 
belief, and again, this is the dominant belief within the field, that changes in pedagogy, changes in instructional design, changes in instructional support, those are the kinds of things that will impact student learning. The presence or absence of technology or tools or any sort of toys um, isn't going to have a meaningful impact by itself unless it impacts the practice of the educator that is in the room. Now, Clark isn't entirely negative about all of these things in terms of, you know, these are things that you shouldn't do or these are examples of bad research. Um, while he hints at them throughout the paper, you really get a sense of them really in his last couple of paragraphs. Um, you know, so he's got a full section here about promising research, um, looking at belief and attributions about tech or about media. And one of the things here that he really emphasizes is this idea of, you know, what are the things that technology allows us to do that the absence of technology doesn't? You know, if you think about testing as a great example, you know, many of you have probably taken the SATs or the ACT. Some of you may have even taken the GREs or the LSATs or the GMATs or, you know, some sort of standardized testing that is supposed to test your aptitude and ability in a particular subject area. If you think about the way in which I had to take my SATs, I sat in a room where I had a paper test that had X number of questions on it, I don't remember how many, but let's say it's 200 questions. And I had to go through and answer all of those 200 questions. Now in theory, the way in which the questions were designed were some were designed at, you know, level A, some were developed at level B, some were developed at level C, and, when, and some at level D. And when the computer actually went and scored those questions, it would determine which of those four levels I was at based upon what ones I got right, what ones I got wrong. For example, if I got all of A and B questions or the majority of the A and B questions right, but I only got, you know, about two-thirds of the C questions right and only a couple of the D questions right, then likely I'm somewhere in that, that level C area. Compare that to when I took the GRE as I was getting ready to go to graduate school where it was a computer adaptive test. And when you go into it, the first thing that it tells you is that, um, you know, you will get a set number of questions. I can't remember what the number was, but let's say it's 30 questions, which basically means everyone gets at least 30 questions. That's your set number. And then what the system does is the computer uses artificial intelligence built into it to figure out how I'm doing after those first 30 questions. And if I'm getting them all right, it'll start asking me harder and harder questions. And the more I get right, the harder the questions will get until I get to a point where I am at a level where I'm answering most of the questions, say, on level C right, but I'm getting most of the questions on level D wrong. And once I go back and forth, bouncing between getting C right and getting D wrong all the time, the computer will figure out that, you know, this guy is at level C because he can't get, you know, enough questions right at the level D area. And in some cases, it'll figure that out very quickly. In some cases, it'll f take much longer to figure out. Um, again, I remember the instructions telling me that... Um, in addition to the 30 set questions that I have, or maybe it was one of the books that I used preparing for the GRE, um, but they specifically tell you that, you know, you might get 50 questions, you might get 150 questions. It all depends upon how you're answering it and essentially whether or not you're doing enough for the computer to figure out what level you're at. You know, those are two very different things that the technology will allow. You know, in the case of the paper-based test, and, you know, paper being a technology, paper and pencil still is a technology. It's a very low-tech technology, but it's a technology. You know, required me to spend three, four hours answering 200 questions, whereas the computer adaptive one, um, I spent less than an hour in the room. If I remember correctly, I got something like 50-odd questions in that hour time period, and then it was able to figure out... Um, you know, what level I was at. So the technology had certain affordances or allowed, you know, the testers, if you will, to be able to figure out what level I was at much quicker. 
use journaling as an example. You know, I can have students journal and they can share that journal, you know, in an exercise book with me. They can share it with other students. But if I do the exact same thing and have them do it in a blog and I have the students publish those blogs online, now all of a sudden I've changed what the technology can allow the students to do. First of all, by doing it that way, there's automatically a spell checker built into that blog so I can have the students go in and check for spelling and grammar, which is something that, at least in an automated way, I can't have them do if I'm doing it you know, with a, a pen and an exercise book. Similarly, if they are published online, Anybody can go in and comment and interact with my students. I can set it up so that I've got a class on the other side of the country or the other side of the world that we're working with and I'm interacting with and my students you know, have the ability to speak to and leave comments for each other, which again, if I was doing the paper and pencil version is something that I couldn't do. You know, so these are affordances of a particular technology. And as Clark indicates here, looking at the affordances of these kinds of things is actually a, a useful um, topic um, for future research. Similarly, he looks at this idea of you know, looking at uh, enjoyment and particularly motivation in media, you know, and how um, whether or not things that students think they do well in, they actually do well in. Um, and two of the study, or three of the studies, actually, that he uh, comments there in that uh, last full paragraph there in page five or 455 are good examples of that, where you had instances where the students reported to either enjoying something and doing poorly on it compared to when they completed material without it, or not enjoying things but still actually appearing to learn more than what they did beforehand. Um, you know, so those looking at issues of motivation, um, looking at issues of perseverance, these are all things that Clark indicates that are actually good, um, reasonable, promising topics that we can use. Even looking at things like student preference um, and how, you know, different technologies impact student preference for everything from pedagogical strategies. Um, looking at attitudes towards technology in general and um, you know the way in which their teachers use those kinds of technology and tools and you know how those motivations might impact um, the educational experience you know those are all valid topics that um, Clark talks about in here and um, you know, one of the, uh, I think this final paragraph actually is, is one that's worth reading, and I'll leave it up on the screen here for a second, um, but I think it, it is really is sort of an important aspect to look at, and he sort of talks about a lot of the topics that I've mentioned were themes along the way. This idea of, you know, the, ad, well, he calls them attributions, but essentially what does technology allow you to do that you can't do without certain pieces of technology or certain tools. Uh, what are student beliefs or learner beliefs as he talks about them um, in terms of the what do they think about the instructional quality? What do they think about the enjoyment of it, which he refers to as entertainment quality? Um, you know, these are the kinds of things, you know, he mentions learner persistence there as another one that we've mentioned along the way. You know, and it's really important that we sort of look into these areas because one of the things that we know about education is there isn't a lot that we can do that actually has a negative impact. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Hattie, and I'll talk a little bit more about him here in a second, uh, but I want to play a short clip here that uh, comes from a speech that he gave about two minutes or so um, to one of these uh, TEDx uh, so it's a TEDx talk that he did, I believe, over in, it was Sweden or Norway, uh, but one of the independent ones. So let's listen in for a couple of minutes here. Now, certainly what I've been doing is trying to say, can we take all the studies that we know of in our business, and certainly there are many, and see what's up this end in terms of what influences student achievement? What's the zero things? What makes no, no difference at all? And what things decrease achievement? And what I've been doing for the last 25 years is screwing it away and collecting data. 
I have close to a quarter of a billion students in the database to try and say, if I could take all the influences from the home, from the family, from the principal, from the schools, from the finance, from the policies, from the curriculum, from the teacher, from the strategies, I've got them all. And I turn them all around. And I say, well, what's the effect? When I get a distribution like this, now you can see here the zero point, the red zone. This is the kind of influences which negatively affect achievement. Now here's the good news. There's not much we do to kids that harm them. 95 to 98% of things that we do in the name of enhancing achievement does enhance achievement. All you need to enhance achievement is a pulse. And so when politicians and parents and everyone gets up and says, we know how to fix schools, they're right. If they say they can improve achievement, because everybody can. And that's one of our problems of our profession, is we have lowered the base so far to say, can we improve achievement? The teacher who comes and says, look, this is the performance of the kids at the start of the year, this is their performance of the late, later at the end of the year. To me, they're criminal. We need to get rid of those teachers, because everybody can do it. But obviously you can see this average which I want to talk about today, this point four. Now the number's not critical, the relativity is. Because what I want to find out is, what are the common story about what's up there in that green zone compared to what's in that yellow zone? So I'm going to pause it right there, and I will include a link to this video in the, de in the description. So when you actually are watching the video that you're watching now, if you scroll down in this description area, and it'll probably actually look like this at the time. If you click on the show more, I'll have a link to where this video is so that you can watch it at the time. Um, and as well these other resources. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, John Hattie is a faculty member at the University of Melbourne, although most of the work that he did, because as you saw in his uh, introduction there, he indicated that he's been doing this for about 25 years now. Spent most of his time at the University of Auckland. And he really became well known to most educators outside of Australian New Zealand area when he published in 2009 this book called Visible Learning. Now essentially what it is is he took all of these studies and you can see how his database has grown because um, if you look here it says that there were more than 50 thousand studies covering 80 million pupils and if you listen to and saw his slide he had a second ago there were now some 60,000 studies I think it was and they were covering 260 million pupils or students. So basically what he does is he's done all of these, taken all of these studies where we compare how students do in certain environments. In some cases it is these media comparison studies that we've been talking about but in many cases it's just straight up studies. You know what impact does um, providing a um, a paraprofessional in the classroom focused specifically upon literacy you know what impact does that have upon student learning and I just look at you know what are the pre and post tests of my students from the beginning of the year to the end of the year when they're working with this individual to see you know is it having a positive impact in impact sorry um, or you know if I um, use uh, a pedagogical strategy like reciprocal teaching or if I provide additional feedback um, you know, what are all those, you know, when you think about all of those things, if I have students in a charter school, or if I have stu a school that starts um, earlier in the morning or later in the day, or I use year-round schooling as opposed to the, the model that we tend to use here in North America. You know, these are all the conditions that he looks at. And at the time, he's got, I think it's about 140 conditions, like 136, 138 different conditions. And he's taken all of these studies and combined all of the like ones. So all of the ones, for example, like that look at the impact of homework. He's combined all of those together and determined what do we know about all of this research in terms of what is the overall impact when you combine all of this research together. And it's interesting because this book was really, while it was published as a popular book, which in theory means it was designed to be read by everybody, it really is more designed for academics. Um, you know, he gets into the whole 
uh, spends, I think, a chapter or two, if I remember correctly, looking at the um, process of meta-analysis and what it does. So he gets a lot into the methodology and the research of it. And really, it's only a couple of chapters where he talks about what you know what this actually found and and what it means for schools a couple of years later he actually came out with this particular book visible learning for teachers now this one is one that in all honesty if it isn't on your bookshelf right now i would highly recommend that you add it to your bookshelf go off to amazon and 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 order it or whatever service you like uh, because essentially it's taking all of the research that hattie had done for that white covered book and basically saying, okay, this is what we know from the research on what actually improves student achievement in the classroom, or at least in teaching in general, you know, within a school environment. Now, here's what it means for you as a teacher. And I think that's a, a very sort of impactful way, and it's something that I would highly encourage that you look. Um, he's got a couple of others. Uh, this one was the third one that he released sort of in this series, uh, Visible Learning, the Science of How We Learn, where it actually started to try to overlay the idea of, you know, what they were finding in the visible learning research in terms of the factors or variables that actually impacted learning, and then what relationship did that have with cognitive sciences. So if you're sort of more of the ed psych kind of, uh, you know, if that's sort of how you think, this book is not bad, although in all honesty, as a starter, I still highly recommend uh, the first one, the blue, or sorry, the second one, the blue one, the one that's focused specifically upon teachers. And then there's this third one, Visible Learning into Action. Um, and this one's sort of an interesting one because what they've done is essentially picked case studies from different parts of the world where they have intentionally tried to... Um, undertake some of the things that Hattie was finding in the Visible Learning book. And I'll be honest, uh, of the four of them, this is the only one that I don't personally have a copy of yet. Um, it's the newest one. It was only released uh, about a year and a half ago. So I haven't had a chance to, to buy it yet, but it is one that is on my uh, to-get list. And um, But it, it's quite interesting because this is actually sort of a really good example of action research studies at a school level for the most part because most of these were looking at full school models although some were looking at classroom models and actually taking what we've learned from the research about what impacts upon student learning and how we could you know go about designing studies to figure out the impact that it has in your own environment now I've mentioned these effects so I wanna show you this particular graph um, now this is a graph that was released about a year ago now. It was April of, of last year, so there's likely been some updates to it. But essentially, these are the effect size basically means how much it improves. Um, so, and he's got it here in descending. So, these are the things at the top that are the best in terms of improving student achievement. And if you scroll down, and I'll sort of scroll and pause a bit so that you can see the list as you go. Um, you know, here are the things that don't have as much of an impact. And in a lot of these cases, you don't necessarily know exactly what aspect of the variable that they're looking at uh, when you're looking at these. For example, you'll notice here's mathematics and um, down here is science. Um, it's not that mathematics teaching or science teaching isn't as impactful as those. You actually sort of need to read the, you know, some of these up here on the top. You actually sort of need to read the book to figure out um, what they were testing. In most cases, when you see just a subject area listed there, um, typically it means that there was additional instruction or additional supports or additional personnel provided specifically for those types of individuals but I mean as you can see here we're started getting to the bottom here now um, you know ones that are in the point oh something really aren't having much of an impact and as you can see down here on the bottom there's actually only five things out of the hundred and thirty eight things that he has here that actually have a negative impact if you exclude all of the ones that are less than say point one um, so the ones that are point oh something as well you're only adding another about eight or nine there. So again, you're only looking at maybe 15 of the um, 138 things that they studied 
that have little or no impact upon student learning. So, and the reason I sort of go over this is because as you're thinking about your own research questions, asking whether something is effective or whether it's, well, first of all, asking whether something is as effective as, or even implying, you know, is this more effective than, um, you know, if that's kind of the way your question is going, that's a media comparison question. And yes, you can go ahead and answer it, and you can collect data that will answer it, but at the end of the day, it won't tell you anything because, you know, as Clark reminds us, there are so many other things that are impacting the student achievement in your classroom, including the fact that you're teaching differently because of the presence of whatever technology or tool you're using, that the results of your research will be meaningless. I mean, sure, you'll, you know, finish a thesis, but in terms of actually telling you something that's going to be useful for your own practice or useful for someone who may have asked you to do some systematic data collection on whatever it is that you're working on, it's going to be a meaningless study. Um, you know, as Hattie implied, or actually as he stated quite frankly um, in his video, you know, asking just is something effective, well according to Hattie, Hattie as long as you have a pulse you're going to have a positive effect on, um, you know, student performance. Uh, now, whether it's a positive effect of 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 compared to an, a positive effect of, you know, 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 or, you know, 1.24, um, you know, that's the big difference. And, you know, so when you start looking at these things, asking is something effective is the wrong question. Um, you know, go back and look at some of the things that, Clark was talking about in his 1983 article and um, you know things like perseverance motivation um, what attributes does the technology provide that teaching without the technology doesn't and then find some instruments that can measure perseverance that can measure motivation uh, from the literature that you're looking through or develop your own questionnaire or um, interview questions that you could use with your students to find out what they think in terms of what the technology allows them to do that if they weren't using the technology they wouldn't be able to do or how they perceive their own persistence or how they perceive the level of motivation that they have but as you're looking at those make sure you write the research question in an appropriate way you know so you wouldn't say you know, what impact does X tool have on student motivation? Because that implies that you're going to actually measure the student's actual motivation. Now, if that's what you plan on doing, that's fine. But then you need to find a, an instrument that is valid and reliable in terms of measuring motivation. If you're interested in just the student's perceptions of motivation, all you need to do is just add a word or two into your question. You know, what impact does tool X have on perceived motivation of students or perceived motivation by students? You know, so now you're essentially trying to figure out, you know, the student perceptions of their motivation, of their perseverance, of whatever it is that you're interested in, in particularly studying. So these are some of the things to think about as you're sort of transitioning between thinking about a research topic and then how do I turn that topic into good, robust research questions or a strong, robust research problem or objective or goal.